Hello, everyone, and welcome to Be Careful Out There. I'm Chris. And I'm Kelsey. And today we're actually going to do something a little different. Instead of having two creepy encounter stories, we're going to share our first true crime story. Yes. <laughs> so one of the things that we're actually looking forward to with our name change is originally when we were called the Let's Not Meet podcast, we focused on the creepy encounter stories. But with Be Careful out there, we can encompass things like creepy encounters, true crime stories, paranormal stories, cryptid stories. And so that's something we're super excited to get into and have a wide variety of episodes for you guys. And remember, if you have stories that you want to send in or stories that you want to recommend, you can send those in to be careful out there podcast at gmail.com. Yes, please do. I'm so excited to read some of your stories. Yeah, Start so sending them in. <laughs> yeah, so far we actually have one listener submitted story. So when we get a couple more, we'll probably do a listener story episode. So if you have stories, be sure to send those in. And Andrew Tate from the Let's Not Meet podcast actually gave us a shout out. And so I know a lot of people from the Let's Not Meet podcast community has come over, given us a try, left us some wonderful reviews. And so yes, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much for all those wonderful comments. And we're so glad to have you. And we hope you guys enjoy. The story I'm going to be covering today is called The Slenderman Stabbing. On May 31st, 2014, a cyclist came across the body of 12-year-old Peyton Lutner, aka Bella, covered in blood in the middle of a clearing. What the cyclist didn't know was that Bella had a total of 19 stab wounds covering her arms, legs, and abdomen. Somehow, Bella survived the attack and made it to the hospital where doctors say one knife wound missed a major artery by one millimeter. So who would stab a 12-year-old girl and leave her to die in the middle of the woods, and why? So I did decide to tell you guys up front that she does survive because there is a lot of other aspects to this story that are just as dark as the stabbing itself. So I didn't want you guys hanging on wondering if she lives or dies. I just wanted to make it clear at the very beginning that she does live because this story is a real roller coaster. So this story begins in the fourth grade when Bella saw Morgan Geyser sitting alone at a lunch table. Bella felt bad for the girl, believing that everyone deserves to have a friend. So Bella sat next to Morgan and they hit it off. Bella described Morgan as very funny with lots of jokes to tell. Bella also said Morgan was great at drawing and had a powerful imagination that always kept things fun and interesting. I think that's a really nice thing that she just uh, saw a girl sitting alone and was like, well, I'm going to go talk to her. You know, it's I know that's so sweet. Kids can be so mean. <laughs> yeah. And it's just really nice that she was able to reach out to her and didn't just like leave her hanging and leave her all alone because some people would have done that. Yeah. Uh, it, I think that really highlights that Bella had a really pure heart. So things began to change in the sixth grade when Morgan befriended Anissa Weir. Morgan and Anissa both developed an obsession with the legend of Slenderman. Bella wasn't fond of Anissa, describing her as cruel and jealous. Bella also did not enjoy the story of Slenderman, as she found it scary and unnerving. Are you familiar with the legend of Slenderman? Um, I know the basics. Okay, so let's get into what Slenderman is. Slenderman was created on June 10th, 2009, when a thread on the Something Awful Internet Forum challenged its users to a Photoshop contest to see who could create the best paranormal images. Eric Knudsen submitted two black and white photos of a tall, slender, faceless man surrounded by children under the pseudonym Victor Surge. Eric was the first person to attach snippets of text to his images from supposed witnesses. These snippets of text revealed the name of the faceless creature as Slenderman and revealed that the kids in the photos may have been abducted. So here are the quotes under the photos. So the first photo read, We didn't want to go. We didn't want to kill them. But its persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. 1983. The okay, yeah, that that's actually pretty creepy. <laughs> yeah, very creepy. <laughs> it reminds me of, like, when I was a kid, I would just go on these, like, creepypasta forums and just read, like, all day. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love creepypastas. <laughs> um, the Ben Drown creepypasta, we've read that one before. And uh, the Russian sleep experiment, those are two of my favorite creepypastas. Oh, the pastas. Russian sleep experiment. Yeah, we'll so probably creepy. cover both of those on here at some point because I really love those stories. They're clearly fictional. 
but they're just really great stories, really well written, and I really enjoy them. So under the second photograph, it said, one of two reported recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library blaze, notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanished, and for what is referred to as the Slender Man, deformities cited as film defects by officials. Fire at library occurred one week later, actual photograph confiscated as evidence. 1986, photographer Mary Thomas, missing since June 13th, 1986. So just to be clear, this um, was all submitted for a contest, so Slenderman was completely made up. This is a fictional character that was made up for the purpose of this content in the creepypasta-style community who really enjoys creepy content that may be fiction, um, yeah, so it, it it's not a real thing, but it started to take on a life of its own. Yeah, and you can clearly see that they put a lot of effort into the lore, like by having all of those specific dates and like making it feel real. Yeah, but it's like two little snippets under two f- paragraphs, and that's the only official lore from the actual creator of oh, Slenderman. Oh, really? That's it? Yeah, that's it. So oh. Slenderman actually started to take on a life of its own as the legend began to spread. Once the images of the Slenderman went viral, fans began creating their own fan art, cosplay, and creepypastas. These stories were detached from the original creator, so many of the stories began spreading without any official lore or canon. Because there's no official lore to Slenderman, his appearance, habits, and abilities may differ depending on who's telling the story. What a legacy. Yeah, like (laughs) he wrote two little snippets under two black and white photos and it just spawned this whole legend of the Slenderman. I remember hearing so much about Slenderman when I was in like junior high. I was at a friend's house after like a cross country meet and we were all playing tag like outside at night in the woods and it was so much fun. And I remember somebody mentioning Slenderman. (laughs) Yeah. We all started freaking out. (laughs) (laughs) So while... His abilities and appearance do differ from story to story. Um, The main accepted uh, view of Slenderman is he has basically no face, a tall, slender man, obviously. Um, And then it's often said that he has multiple arms or as if one arm branches into multiple arms. Oh, lovely. Yes. And it's typically said to be more like tendrils like his arms more hands to grab more kids yes <laughs> well some people took the stealing of the 14 kids that was mentioned in the second paragraph or under the second photo and then um how the first photo said we didn't want to kill them so a lore developed around that that these children were taken by Slenderman and they become his proxies and do his bidding for him. And that actually comes back later in this story. Okay, that's good to know. So we're going to take a second and read a example of a Slenderman creepypasta story. So this was not made by the original creator. It was made by someone else. So again, there is no official lore to Slenderman, but this is a, an example of what a Slenderman story would sound like. Okay. After waking up with a jolt, the girl laid in bed a few seconds longer, reaching over to switch on her bedside lamp. She tried to remember exactly what had stolen her sweet slumber away. When she couldn't, the brunette swung her legs over the side of the bed and heaved herself up. Checking the time on her phone, she snorted when she saw that it was midnight, the witching hour. Honestly, I'm used to the witching hour being considered 3 a.m., but... Maybe it differs. I always heard both growing up. And then I remember reading somewhere that apparently like the veil is thinner between the hours of 12 and 3. And it sort of peaks around 3 a.m. That makes sense. Knowing that sleep would only evade her, she left her bedroom for the kitchen. A good cup of coffee on her mind. Okay, I've woken up many times in the (laughs) middle of the night. Um, and there will be times when I wake up at like 4 or 5 a.m. And I'm like, okay, it's clear I'm not going back to sleep. So I'll like take a shower or make a cup of coffee or whatever. But I've never looked at my phone and saw that it was midnight and been like, eh, good enough and just get up out of bed. I've never done that. (laughs) That was enough sleep for the night. (laughs) Oh, man. As she passed by her front door, a chill spread like liquid fire down her spine. It's only winter, she told herself, focusing again on the coffee plan. Measuring out scoops, water, and preparing her cup kept her occupied. 
but as the dark liquid boiled, she had nothing left to keep her mind from wandering off. The chill returned, and she couldn't help but glance behind her to the front door. It stood there innocently enough, just like always. The deadbolt was still in place, and she could see nothing amiss with it. Turning back to her coffee, she did her best to forget about the feeling. With her cup in hand, she started back towards her bedroom. As she walked by the front door, she decided that a quick glance out of the peephole would calm her restless mind. Oh, no. <laughs> the chill worsened with each step she took towards the door and further away from the safety and warmth of her blankets. She pressed her empty hand against the cold, metal door and took a deep breath before leading her eye to the peephole. I'm so scared. <laughs> In this scenario, if you had a weird chill, would you look? No, absolutely not. And I'm not going into the kitchen in the middle of the night to make coffee. <laughs> true, I'm true. I'm going to hide under my covers. Yes. Maybe turn the bedroom light on. Yeah, we even bring water like downstairs with us so that way we don't have to because go in the hell kitchen if I'm in the middle. I'm going to go into the kitchen unless I have to. <laughs> the good thing is like our dogs like to sleep upstairs, so if there's anything crazy going on up there, they would go wild and we would know. So, that is yeah. um I do feel pretty assured yes, around here. That feels very nice to me. <laughs> At first, she could only see an inky blackness that somehow seemed to swirl in itself. Okay. When she blinked in surprise, the void melted away. She wished it hadn't. In its place, there stood what she could only guess was once a man. The limbs were long and inhumanly awkward, with bulky joints branching off into several arms, not unlike the branches of a tree. The creature was draped in a black suit, somehow making the thing more nightmarish. The icing on the proverbial cake, however, was what passed as the hellish thing's face. It was as though her mind blurred the ghastly visage to spare itself further shock and horror. She shoved herself away from the door, with the hand still pressed against it. The scolding mug of coffee fell, and liquid burning her bare legs as she fell backwards and tried to crawl away from the door. She knew, somehow, that her mind hadn't been playing tricks on her. As she crab walked away from the door, she watched as tendrils, as black as the void <laughs> she first saw, snake through the cracks. She was trapped between the instinct to flee and the gut feeling to not turn her back on the door. When the door jolted, the urge to flee overcame her and she slipped in the burning liquid as she tried to make it back to her room. She knew deep down that she was trapping herself in a corner, but she had to get away from the door. The girl was halfway down the hallway when she heard the previous locked door creak oh. open. She screamed and slipped into a wall, cracking her chin on it and stunning her. After that, there was only blackness. Nicole? A warm male voice snapped a woman out of her trance. As she turned around, she was met by one of her sister's doctors. She nodded, not sure if she should say anything, or if she could even find the voice if she did have something to say. That morning, she had gotten an urgent phone call from the hospital, saying that her sister, Lindsay, was there. Before they had even let her see her, the doctors had pulled her off to the side and insisted that they talk to her about what might have happened. Phrases like self-inflicted and assault had been thrown around, and Nicole felt her mind reel. She still hadn't fully understood what they had been saying until she saw Lindsay with her own eyes. Her sister had a bandage wrapped around her head, covering both of her ears as well as her eyes. They said it was to keep her now deadened eyes from drying out and to keep the infection out of the wounds Lindsay had made to her ears. The doctors had guessed that either she or someone else had jammed a pencil into them to keep her off balance or to deafen her against something. Ooh. There was a mix of first and second degree burns on her hands, legs, and feet from what was assumed to be the coffee her neighbors found spilled all over the entry to her apartment. As Nicole walked into her sister's hospital room for the first time, she thought she had spied the silhouette of a man in the window. That, she knew, was impossible. Her sister's room was on the third story of the hospital. Oh, it's not even over. That's the end of the story. A oh. big cliffhanger leaves you hanging. So oh that, my God. When you were talking about like 
pencil wounds. Oh it's my. the creepy tree man. His branches. His branches that he has for fingers. I didn't even think about that. Ooh. Like, ooh, yeah. Ouch. Just the thought of anything being jammed in my ear sounds so horrible right now. Oh. You're you're actually having a problem with your ears right now. Like your ear, <laughs> your ears like clogged up, and so you're like waiting on this tool to come in to like suck the earwax out. Like, ugh. Oh, thanks for sharing that all over the internet. Yeah, why not? <laughs> well, you did say it sounds like you're underwater, so it does. This is just one of many Slenderman tells that can be found online. Unbeknownst to Bella, as Morgan and Anissa became more and more obsessed with Slenderman, they began to plan Bella's murder. They believed that if they successfully murdered Bella, they would be allowed to live with Slenderman at his house, which Morgan believed to be located in the Nicolet National Forest. They also believed that if they failed to kill Bella, Slenderman would murder their families. What a dilemma. Again, this story was completely made up. Like, Slenderman is not real. It was completely made up. But these 12-year-old girls are absolutely convinced that he's real. I mean... I can sort of see myself believing this as a 12 year old like I was into like so many creepy things like I'm not saying that it would have compelled me to really do anything but (laughs) I guess you're going to be getting into that. (laughs) Yeah I mean it definitely makes it sound like these girls weren't necessarily the most mentally stable which we will get to. So, May 30th, 2014 was supposed to be a fun night. The three girls had a sleepover birthday party for Morgan's 12th birthday. Fun. Morgan and Anissa had planned to duct tape Bella and stab her in the neck that night to murder her. But the girls claimed- imagine. They're having this conversation. Just listen to this. This is going to blow your mind. The girls claimed that they were too tired after a long day of roller skating and decided to push their plans to the next day. Okay, I just that just gave me chills. These are children. Children. They they were roller skating all day and they were like, eh, so we'll just move that like murder thing to tomorrow. Like as if it was a business meeting. Like we'll just move from it to these tomorrow. Innocent activities that you associate with childhood. And then they're also plotting the murder of their friend. It's insane. Because they feel like they have to, like they truly believe this. Yeah, because they believe if not, Slenderman will murder their entire families. So the next day, the morning of May 31st, 2014, they planned to kill Bella that morning in a park bathroom. Anissa claimed to have slammed Bella's head against a concrete wall in an attempt to knock her out and make it easier to kill her and not have to look her in the eyes while they did it. Like this shows that they know that this isn't the right thing to do because they didn't even want to look her in the eyes while they did it, or at least Anissa didn't. Morgan recalled things the same way, stating that after Anissa tried to knock Bella out, Bella got furious and Morgan was pacing around nervously. The one thing that really surprises me is that Bella didn't like run to an adult or just like, peace out of there after someone literally slammed her head into a she concrete was probably wall. In shock. I mean, it's just like when you're a child, you don't you don't always necessarily understand what things are normal and what things aren't. And like maybe maybe Bella just didn't really know what to do after that happened and just kind of wanted to just forget about it and move on, which is honestly ends up being the worst thing that she could have done, unfortunately not blaming her in any way. She was just a child. They're all just children. So this is when Morgan and Anissa decided to take Bella out into the woods to murder her. They told her to lay down and cover herself with leaves and twigs. Bella complied thinking this was some silly game of hide and seek. Again, they are children. They're like, she thinks they're playing hide and seek while her friends have this like demonic idea going on to kill her. Oh my God. This is heartbreaking. Morgan later told the police, we led her there and tricked her. People who trust you become very gullible. It was sort of sad. This is just how they're talking to the authorities? Yeah, like with almost no remorse. That's when Morgan pulled out a kitchen knife and stabbed Bella 19 times in the legs, arms, and torso while Anissa looked on. The knife pierced two major organs, Bella's liver and stomach, and as I said previously, just barely missed her heart. Morgan told the police that she felt no remorse, 
even though she thought she would. Morgan said, I actually felt nothing. Morgan's parents recall noticing her lack of empathy at a very young age. In a USA Today interview, her parents talked about the first time they watched Bambi with her. They expected Morgan to be upset when the mother died. However, Morgan just said, run Bambi, run, get out of there, save yourself. She showed no sign of sadness, which really shocked her parents. Morgan gave little indication that she would ever indulge in any violent activities. Her parents described her as quiet and creative. It sounds like she's always been unemotional, maybe like non-violent sociopath or something like that, but there was no indication before this that she would ever be violent. After stabbing Bella, Morgan recalls Bella telling her, I trusted you and I hate you. I think that's a pretty reasonable thing to say after they just stabbed you 19 times. Exactly. Then Morgan and Anissa told Bella that they would leave to go get help, but they never did. Morgan and Anissa. Okay, that is fucked up. Yeah. Why say, why, why say that? Why say anything at that point? Just leave. Don't even give her like an inkling of hope. I mean, Bella clearly did not trust them and we'll get to that in just a second. Morgan and Anissa then took off with a backpack full of supplies to go find Slenderman where they believed they would be accepted to become his proxies. They literally thought Bella was going to lay there and die. But having been left to die, Bella crawled her way out of the woods and flagged down a nearby cyclist for help. So I think Bella knew that there was no chance they were actually going to get help and so luckily she took things upon herself to go get help and that's honestly probably what saved her life. I'm glad. When Bella woke up from surgery, she remembers her first thoughts being pure panic as she wondered if the girls had been caught or if they were still roaming free. Could they even be here at the hospital? Imagine just the pain that you're in, but also just the panic over your life and also just not knowing if they're going to be back. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine waking up not knowing if they had been caught and just like being so scared, just like frantically looking around like... I bet her heart rate like spiked through the roof as soon as she woke up because like that sounds terrifying, not knowing. There's just no imagining what she felt like. However, the police already had both girls in custody. They had caught up with them about five miles from the scene of the crime. They had made it that far. I don't think I put in here uh, exactly how far it was that they were going, but I think it was somewhere between like 25 and 40 miles that they were trying to go. So like they had made it a they good knew chunk. They they had done a thing. Both girls quickly confessed to the crimes, saying that they had to kill Bella or Slenderman would kill their entire families. While each girl claimed that the other originally came up with the idea to kill Bella, the police quickly began to suspect that Morgan was the mastermind of the entire plan, describing her as the ringleader. I'm having a hard time fathoming how... Okay, so so one kid could do this, but she was able to drag another kid into this. Just two kids at the same school. What are the odds? Just imagine being like the police officers in this scenario, interrogating and just being like, two 12-year-olds for probably one of the most heinous crimes you've ever seen. I, I cannot imagine. What a shitty day of work for those officers. I know, like, how traumatizing. Yeah. In Wisconsin, people over the age of 10 can be tried as adults in attempted homicide cases. Both girls were charged with attempted first-degree intentional homicide. Anissa took a plea deal on a lesser charge and pleaded guilty, but was later found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. That was like the court document wording. She was sentenced to 25 years to life in a mental health institution with a mandatory three-year confinement and was released after only seven years. She was released into her father's custody, has to receive psychiatric treatment, must wear a GPS monitor, and has limited internet access while she lives under supervision until the age of 37, which would roughly be about 2039. So she's the one who didn't do any of the stabbing, but she was still in on the plan. She tried to knock out Anissa. She was there the whole time. While she didn't inflict any of the wounds, she was still present for the whole crime. I guess this would work differently in different states, but you were talking about how um, they cited mental illness. And I'm just wondering, what if that wasn't the case? What if they didn't find any mental illness that they could prove? Like, 
What could they do with her at that age? It definitely varies、um, state to state. Some states even have a minimum arrest age to where, like, people under a certain age, you can't arrest them. And then certain states don't even have a minimum. Like, certain states, you could arrest, like, a four year old. But yeah, it would all really vary、uh, state to state. Yeah. So Morgan, on the other hand, pleaded guilty to the original charge, but was also later found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. While growing up, Morgan experienced hallucinations such as ghosts, colors melting down walls, and imaginary friends. One common hallucination, she called it, had a body that was the color of smoke or ink and would appear behind her in mirrors or could be seen shifting around corners similar to that of Slenderman. That would be creepy to just look in a mirror and see something behind you. Yeah, I'm wondering if she was like, if she at all seemed to be afraid of this or if she was just kind of like going along with it. I don't know. I wonder if this came out after the fact, if this came from Morgan herself or if this came from her parents. Like, did her parents know about this and not take her to a psychiatrist to like get this checked out? Or is this something that like Morgan later talked about? I'm not 100% sure on that. I didn't really look too deeply into that, but now I'm kind of curious. Either way, that's inviting a whole lot of trauma. After Morgan's arrest, her mom said that Morgan became floridly psychotic. Correctional officers reported many strange behaviors, including talking to herself, pretending to be a cat, keeping ants as pets, and even speaking to fictional characters like Slenderman and Severus Snape. Like Slenderman and Severus Snape. I, I don't know why, but like the Severus Snape part was like really funny to me. <laughs> Not <laughs> what kinda, I was expecting. Yeah, that kind of caught me off guard when I was reading that. All right, so here's where you kind of start to feel bad for Morgan. It's crazy that you could feel bad for somebody who committed such a heinous crime, but you'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. In the fall of 2014, Morgan was moved to the Winnebago Mental Health Institute to determine whether she was competent enough to stand trial. This is when Morgan was diagnosed with early onset childhood schizophrenia. I just want to say that not all people with schizophrenia are violent.、Um, they can often be portrayed that way in movies, but、um, a lot of people with modern medicine who have schizophrenia can live a fairly normal life as long as it's appropriately treated. Morgan's father、uh, is also said to have schizophrenia and, by all accounts, seems to have lived a fairly normal life. In fact, most people with schizophrenia. I'm、oh, so wait, happy that you that. are talking about that because the way that mental illness gets represented in media sometimes is just appalling. Yeah, and it's like, luckily, modern science has come so far that schizophrenia can often be treated very well. Like, obviously, there's varying levels of schizophrenia. Some、mm-hmm. people have only. I think the most common type, if I remember correctly, is just auditory hallucinations. Some people have、uh, visual hallucinations. The, the worst thing is when it's not treated and they have like a full psychotic break. That's what I've heard. But most of the time, if they stay on top of their medications, they're usually able to, you know, just live a normal life, just like you and me. Yeah. So for Morgan, instead of immediately being treated for her schizophrenia, They focused on teaching her about the laws to prepare her for trial. This really highlights that the justice system doesn't really care about people's mental health. Nearly a year and a half later, she was deemed competent to stand trial. Morgan was left untreated for her schizophrenia for 19 months while she was awaiting trial, leaving her in a state of psychosis and out of touch with reality. For that is 19、so、months. Inhumane. <laughs> yeah. Like the criminal justice system did not care. And it said she、She's、was a kid. in a state of psychosis and out of touch with reality. How did they ever deem her competent to stand trial? Exactly. That's what I'm wondering. In December of 2015, Morgan was sent back to the Winnebago Mental Health Institute, where she was given antipsychotic meds that stabilized her mental state and a l l o w her to feel remorse for her actions. In March of 2016, she was sent back to jail, this time with the medications, where it said that she once again rapidly deteriorated. That's so sad. Morgan was sentenced to 40 years to life with at least a three year locked confinement at the Winnebago Mental Health Institute 
where she remains to this day and for the foreseeable future. On June 23rd, 2022, Morgan appeared in court after petitioning for release and a judge did rule for her to be evaluated by three doctors over the course of the summer. Now, I didn't put this in my notes, but I do believe that I read that Morgan's mother said that when she was moved from the mental health institute to a prison closer to the court, um, so that way she could appear for this trial, it was said once again that she rapidly deteriorated mentally after being removed from the mental health institution. By August 10th of 2022, it appears that Morgan herself withdrew her petition for release. So it looks like she was moved to a jail closer to the courthouse for this petition. Uh, the judge ruled for her to be evaluated. And then as she rapidly deteriorated, she realized like, this isn't going to work. Like I don't need to be released. And so she withdrew her own petition from everything that I read. That seems to be what happened. At least that shows some self-awareness. Um, and it seems like she knows that she needs the treatment that she's getting in the health institute. I just hope that they're treating her well. It's sad that she can really only stay in reality when she's in the mental health institute. But hopefully there she can at least live a semi-normal life. I know it's a life of confinement, but it seems that maybe she understands that that's what's best for her or at least her family does. I hope that she can at least be mentally stable there and enjoy part of her life versus being released and something else bad happening yeah so let's talk about the aftermath as i stated earlier bella did survive the attack she was released from the hospital seven days after the initial attack bella returned to school in september of 2014 so this basically happened at the end of one school year uh, and then she kind of was able to start school the beginning of the next school year eric nudson the original creator of slenderman released a statement saying, I am deeply saddened by the tragedy in Wisconsin, and my heart goes out to the families of those affected by this terrible act. Aww. Sloshed Train, the admin for the creepy pasta wiki, stated that the stabbing was an isolated incident that did not accurately represent the creepy pasta community. He also stated that the creepy pasta wiki was a literary site and that they do not condone murder or satanic rituals. Of course. After this, members of the Creepypasta community held a 24-hour YouTube live stream from June 13th to 14th of 2014 to raise money for Bella. I didn't see exactly how much the live stream raised for her. The purpose of the live stream was to show that the Creepypasta community cared for the victim and that they do not condone real-world violence even though they enjoy fictional violent stories. That's so cool that they did that. The city of Madison, Wisconsin, held a one-day Bratwurst Festival to raise money for Bella's medical bills. The event attracted 250 volunteers and raised $70,000 for Bella's family. So where is Bella now? In a public interview in 2019, Bella was doing well and discussed her plans to start college. When asked about what she would say to Morgan if she had the chance, Bella said that she would thank her because the whole situation inspired her to go into the medical field to help others. Oh my goodness, she's so pure. She seems to have the purest heart. I cannot imagine feeling the same way um, in her shoes, even though from an outside perspective, truly everybody involved has my sympathy, but I wouldn't necessarily expect that from her. That would be fine. Yeah, and like nobody nobody has the right to tell her that she should forgive exactly. Morgan and move on. Like that's her decision to make. And if she chose not to forgive her, like, I wouldn't blame her. Yeah, I wouldn't blame her either. Like she has the right to do that. But the fact that like she took a glass half full kind of approach. She to just this seems is, like an amazing person. Yeah. I, I hope she lives a wonderful life. And that is the end of our story, and that is the story of the Slenderman stabbing. That is so heavy. Yeah. I'm it, tearing up. It's a it's a crazy story. Um, I remember hearing about this probably as it was going on or like as the court case was going on. Um, and then I had kind of forgot about it for a few years until we started this podcast. And I was thinking like, what would be a good true crime case to discuss? And I thought this would be a really good one. I know. And like, this was just a great discussion too. There's a lot of things to talk about with this case, especially around like mental illness and things like that. And I feel like just a lot of people could 
maybe just hear about this and really not have any of that background information. I don't know. I feel like you really did the story justice. So thank you. I tried my best. It's my <laughs> first time covering a story like this. And so hopefully with true crime cases in the future, hopefully we get better and better at our storytelling and covering all the facts. We just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has left us wonderful, positive comments in the past few days. Like we really appreciate that. And that yes. makes it really fun to continue doing this podcast. Um, and we really hope you enjoy. And if you want to support the podcast, the best thing you can do to help us out is to give us a five star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. That really pushes us up the charts and it helps people when they're trying to decide if they want to give us a chance. If they see those good reviews, they're much more likely to give us a chance. So thank you for that in advance. And we appreciate you listening. Yes. And be sure to follow us if you haven't already, if you want to hear new episodes every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And as always, be, be careful, careful out, out there. there.